just consider how you might react to these things if you were hearing them for the very first time in the mindset of a Greek or a Roman where children and women have no value. We're going to look at one passage um, to kind of set the stage here. It's from Colossians chapter 3. There are much more radical, if you know the New Testament, there are many, many, many more radical teachings than this. These are very simple, but they're all together in one passage, so I thought I would share these. We'll start here with wives. Wives, Paul writes to the church in Colossus. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. And to which wives would say, to my husband? Do you know my husband? If you heard the story that I have about my husband, you would not be asking me to submit to my husband. But that is exactly what he's doing. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. He goes on. How about husbands? Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Well, why in the world? We're like, duh. Why would he need to write to husbands to not be harsh with their wives? Because husbands were harsh with their wives. Men were harsh with everything in the first century Roman and and Greek worlds. They were harsh with their servants. They were harsh with their children. They were harsh with one another, and they were harsh with their wives. Why not? If this one breaks down, I'll get another one. They were a possession. But into this world, Paul would write, husbands love your wives. And do not be harsh with them. And in other places we see, and we'll see in the series that Paul writes, that we should love our wives because they are co-heirs with us in Christ. That when Jesus came, he came to die for every one of us, children, women, men, and at the foot of the cross, every person has equal footing. We are all equal. We are all brothers and sisters. We are all co-heirs with Christ. We are all inheriting the kingdom of God. And as a result of this equality, husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. We love this one. Children, obey your parents in everything, all the time, whether you agree with them or not. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Amen. All right. We go on. Fathers. This is all boom, 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 boom. Four verses in a row. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. I find it interesting, you know, that word embitter in other translations, it'll be exasperated. Don't make them impatient. Don't break them down. And it's interesting that this is written to fathers, not to mothers. Not to parents, but there is a dynamic in a family in which a father has weight to his words that mothers don't. And and I'll tell you, I have seen this in the eyes of my two sons that I have broken this commandment more than I can count. There have been times when I have said things to them because I love them and I want them to grow up with strong character and I want them to be the very best at everything that they do, that I'll take the position as a coach or, uh, you know, a boss or, uh, you know, uh, someone lording it over them and I'll tell them something that's true, something that they need to hear, something that will make them better. But it, it exasperates. It breaks down. It embitters. It makes impatient. This is one of the things I'm learning as a father, that my, wo- my words have weight. I need to be careful with those words. And this was a dynamic that Paul understood because of the teachings of Jesus 2,000 years ago. And we still have this today as a command. Fathers, don't embitter your children or they will become discouraged. And so if we were to take these four verses, this one itty-bitty teaching on family in the New Testament, here would be our summary. Husbands, love your wives and be gentle. Don't be harsh. Wives, submit to your husbands. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, do not irritate your children. There we go. It is as simple as that, right? Now we can kind of say the benediction, get out of here. Just go do that stuff, guys. Just go do it, and we'll all have healthier families. But that's the problem, isn't it? Doing those things aren't that easy, are they? They they don't come naturally. They don't come intuitively. These things are difficult. These instructions are a bit on the idealistic side. This is probably not the way your family looks, at least not all of the time. Which brings us to the gap that we need to keep in mind. 
The gap we need to keep in mind, the, the tension we need to manage, is the gap between the reality of where my family is right now, whatever that looks like, and God's ideal for what my family should look like. So we have the reality, my family and all its warts and kids not listening to their parents and husbands being harsh with wives and wives not submitting to husbands and all that. We have that reality of our family. And then we have this ideal, this place where God wants us to be, where you know, we are loving one another mutually and submitting and not be, being gentle and obeying and all of that. And in between is a gap. And it's a gap that we feel. And in that gap, there is this tension. The gap creates tension. And that tension will often work itself out in different emotions, maybe emotions of frustration or shame or guilt or inadequacy. Because we we look at where our families are, and we imagine where they could be or where they should be, we think of all the mistakes we're making and all the mistakes we continue to make and all the mistakes that other people in my family are making. And again, consider where we should be about you know, husbands loving wives and wives submitting to husbands and children you know, obeying their parents. And we feel a tension. And we have questions. And we don't like the tension that's created in this gap. Because we don't like any tension in our lives, really. And, and we want to resolve the tension. We want to eliminate the tension, get rid of it. But as we've discussed in the past, there are some tensions in life that we cannot resolve. There are some tensions in life that need to be maintained in order to have healthy lives. And this is one of those tensions. It cannot be resolved. It has to be maintained. We need to learn to live in this tension. 